Yeah, do we ever have a big week on today now? Now, I'm sorry if that sounded sarcastic, because we do. Yes, we do. Ladies, listen up. We're going to learn some simple makeup tips to hide your imperfect nose. And in the craft corner, we'll look at some DIY projects that are so easy that even you, an idiot, could do them. Plus, on Twitter, you can chime in with what you think this year's American flag should look like. I hope it's flowers and race cars this yeah. time. All that, and Jim goes to his stupid fucking train <laughs> festival again. <laughs> you won't want to miss it. Every morning is a good morning on Today Now. <laughs> <laughs> you probably have quite a few opinions about what's going on in the news cycle right now. But it's important to remember one thing. You're wrong. Here's why. To start, you're completely missing the point, and everything you think is actually at odds with reality when you look at the data. In fact, you're nowhere close to being accurate. It's simple to understand when you stop for a second and actually look at the issues. Once you open your eyes, you'll see that you're wrong about each and every one of them. Wrong, 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 wrong. But what about this other thing I heard? No. If the past is any indication of the future, not only is there no chance that you'll ever be right, all signs suggest you will never even come close once in your lifetime. The only way you'll ever be right is to repeat everything I say, word for word, to every single person you know. Until then, you're wrong. Coming up next, we'll meet yet another smug guy who's scaled Mount Everest. Oh, we've had too many of these guys. Over. You're going to hate this one. This guy is uh, particularly hateable. <laughs> but right now, we've got a very special guest here in the studio with us, and I do mean special. Some idiot savants are skilled with music or numbers. 12-year-old James Kamara's skill is spelling. Like a real-life rain man. That's right, Tracy. Here's him winning the New Jersey State Spelling Bee. He did such a good job there that he gets to represent the state in the Nationals. And he joins us now live right here in the Today Now studios. James, good morning. Good morning to you. James, we are both so proud of you. Yeah, when I won, I was like, yes. Yeah. Well, now, James, tell us, how did you get to be able to spell like that? My brain works normally, so I, don't, I can't even fathom it. Well, I study it like two or three hours a day. What is going on in your brain right now? I, I think you can probably understand everything we're saying, but is it all jumbled up? I mean, do you mm -hmm. see random colors and flashes and stuff like that? No, I don't. I just, I'm fine. I understand your school has actually put you in a special institution, the Gifted and Talented Program. Well, those are accelerated learning classes. Ah, uh, is that what they're calling them now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take yeah. another look at you up on that big high stage. E-U-D-A-E-M-O-N-I-C. Eudaimonic. That's correct. <laughs> yeah, see, look at him there. I mean, he may not be able to feed himself, but he can spell a word I can't even pronounce. Well, well I can feed myself just fine. James, the other kids must be so cruel to you. Oh, are they? No, they? Do they call you yeah. names? No, I'm fine. Oh, I bet they do. I bet no, it no. really hurts your feelings. They never called me names. Well, huh? James, do you know if your mother did a lot of drinking or had a drug problem while she was pregnant with you? No, she didn't. She was fine. I really admire her strength in raising you. I mean, I would have just tossed you in the gutter to end your agony. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm just smart. Right. James, if you want to howl or pound your head against something, you just go ahead and There's do it. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm just smart. You just do whatever really you have not. to I'm do. Just, I'm just smart. It's okay, it's okay. James. Okay. Hold on. Oh, whoa, now. Hold on. Take a seat. It's okay. Relax. It's okay. Well, okay, all right. Calm wrong. down. All right, calm down. All right, uh, I think we need some help in here, guys. Uh, no, 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 no. Whoops. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, what a great little guy he is, huh? He just got a little excited there for a minute, I think. But... Do you still have all of your feet and hands? If so, Dr. Good wants to know how you did it. Send a picture of your extremities and a stool sample to Dr. Good at 730 North Franklin Street, 7th floor, Chicago, Illinois, 60654. One of the most common reasons people go see the doctor is when they see someone who's a different height and they get scared. But having a different height than someone else is perfectly normal. Now the average American male is 5 feet 10 inches tall, while the perfect human will be about 6 feet tall when he finally matures. But just because someone's a different height than you doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. Here today are Jonathan and Richard. Richard, would you please stand for us? That's right, that's right. He is short. Now, Jonathan, could you please stand for us? Yeah. 
Jonathan is tall. Now, I examined these two before the show, and they are both in perfect health. That doesn't seem possible. The, the tall guy looks a lot healthier, like giraffes, which are very healthy animals. The short guy probably has cancer. I didn't find any evidence of that, but it could be so. I think I'll cut one of them open so I can take a look for myself. We have some more special guests we'd like you to meet. Bring them out. Look at these tall people. Now, all of them are perfectly healthy and normal, except for one, he has a urinary tract infection, but that has nothing to do with his height. And we have some more special guests waiting backstage. No, 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 come on now. There's nothing wrong with these people. They're just a little short. And that's the weird thing about height. Some of these short people are actually tall. That's right. What is your name, sir? Brian. And how old are you? I'm in fourth grade. And in your class, how tall are the kids your age? I'm taller than a lot of them. And you, sir, please step forward. Now, compared to, say, the Burj Tower in Dubai, you're not very tall at all, are you? No. He's short, and he's tall. <laughs> Look at this guy. <laughs> he can't reach. <laughs> oh, I love it. Do you ever have any problems being this tall? Um, not really. I've been tall Come all my life. One. You mostly just get used to it. That's because we were made that way. Now, say it with me, folks. Tall man, short man. Tall man, short man. Tall man, short man. Tall man, short man. Great energy. We're going to have more of it when we get back. Tall man, short man. Tall man, short man. Tomorrow on an all new Dr. Good, dentist Dr. Nagume tells you how to get more teeth. More teeth equals more confidence. And one lucky audience member is in for a mouthful. Let's give Rebecca one big tooth in the middle of her palate. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Let's give away more teeth. Only on Dr. Good. An update to a truly inspirational story we first told you about earlier this week. I'm talking about Brian Pete, the fat boy from Richmond, Virginia, who successfully averted ridicule by swimming, get this, with his shirt on. Amazing. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar, Brian, who's been fat since birth, was tired of being made fun of at the community pool. So when it came time to hit the water, Brian devised a plan to keep his upper body covered. Now today, the Onion News Network has more on that fat little boy's big fat discovery. A supersized welcome to you, my friend Brian. Thank Thanks you. for being here. You bet. So, Brian, for our viewers who may not be familiar with our story, tell us what happened. Well, I kept my shirt on when I was swimming. Yes, you did, but it was a lot more than that because that shirt shielded you from the ridicule of others. It made them completely unaware of your oversized stomach and a pair of floppy breasts. Isn't that right? Yeah, no one laughed. Wonderful. So, Brian, at the pool, without the shirt on, the children made fun of you? Yes, I'd usually get made fun of because, well, before the shirt. What kind of names were these kids calling you uh, at the pool? Meathead, mm -hmm. Fatso, Lard Butt, Wally the Whale. Porky, Hog, Fat Ass, Double Wide, Butterball, those sorts of things, right? Yeah. Brian, how did you come up with the idea? Well, I went into the bathroom stall like I normally would, mm -hmm. and I just decided, when I was about to take off my shirt, I'm just going to keep it on. Can you tell us a little bit about the shirt itself? Well, it was one of my white T-shirts. I usually wear them as undershirts because I sweat through my button downs. Just a, just a normal white right. T-shirt. Right. Well, right. But when it got wet, it was like a protective shield against the laughter of the other kids at the pool. Yes. You were able to disguise mm -hmm. uh, being a porker and uh, avert uh, that sort of uh, treatment from your peers. I'm just glad no one tripped me into the, when I was at the pool and no one tried to throw my towel into the water or anything like that. That's, it's just truly an inspirational story, Brian. We're so glad to have you into our studios in person. And guess what? We're sending Brian down on the street with our weatherman, Steve Merck, who's got one of those big 
fire hoses. He's going to wet him down right there on the street in a white T-shirt, Brian. It's going to be a lot of fun. Savvy consumers are lining up today to be the first to purchase Sony's brand new stupid piece of shit that doesn't do the goddamn thing it's fucking supposed to. Onion News Network Tech Trends reporter Jeff Tate has more. Thanks, Brandon. It's being called the biggest fucking waste of your hard-earned money to come along in years. Sony's new stupid box thing hit the shelves at crowded malls and overpriced electronic stores around yeah, the country yeah, today. It it's got a whole bunch more memory and megapixels and whatnot than any of the other TV shit that I already have. I can't wait to get home and spend my whole fucking night trying to figure the goddamn thing out. If you can somehow claw and bite your way through the impossible to open packaging, this stupid piece of shit offers a wide variety of frustrating as hell functions, including flashing random fucking words and numbers on its display screen, not coming with the fucking little doohickey thing it's supposed to, and being goddamned ass backward as fuck. Sony spokesman Alan Compton said the company designed this sucking fucking goddamn thing to make everyone in the modern home want to tear their fucking eyeballs out. We listened hard to what our customers said they wanted the most out of their own home entertainment system, and then we pumped out this impossible to use fucking piece of shit. Anyone mystified by the device's numerous extraneous features can scroll through the interactive help menu, a labyrinthine maze of indecipherable topics of use to fucking no one. We want people to be screaming in unison from houses across the country, work, work you cocksucking piece of shit, what is wrong with you? Why can't you work like a normal machine? With a hundred million dollar nationwide campaign to plaster irritating ass advertisements for the retarded hunk of garbage every single goddamn place you look, Sony is expecting it to become the next fucking gizmo you absolutely have to fucking own if you don't want to feel like a toothless hillbilly living in some hillbilly shack somewhere. I love bullshit like this. You know, I Basically, I'll buy any goddamn thing that I see in an ad. The fucking piece of shit is available now. Fuck. So run out and pick one up and invite all of your friends over to see if Fuck. any of them can figure out this motherfucking time vampire. Unless Fuck. one of them is a rocket scientist, Sony pretty much guarantees fucking tees they'll have no chance. For the Onion News Network, I'm Jeff Tate. Thanks, Jeff. Sony says they plan to release an upgraded 800 gigabyte version of this piece of shit by the end of the year, just when you figured out the goddamn remote control for this one. It never ends, this shit. To help reduce you to a state of constant panic about a hypothetical doomsday scenario you have no ability to control, we now present The Onion Explains Nuclear Proliferation. At present, there are an estimated 16,000 nuclear weapons in the world, each with enormous destructive potential. However, the vast majority of them are concentrated in World War II documentaries, currently being watched by your dad on the History Channel. Not only does your dad's DVR house an enormous nuclear arsenal, his entertainment center also contains a collection of DVDs and largely unlabeled VHS tapes with enough fissile material to wipe out humanity 50 times over. In fact, your dad's willingness to share the documentaries with other dads has led many experts to question whether the nuclear stockpiles are properly monitored and whether it's now even possible to know who possesses a nuclear weapon at all. Because of their immense destructive potential, the world's nuclear facilities are safeguarded by a bunch of really huge guys. We're talking absolutely jacked. With one of these muscle freaks stationed outside every missile silo and uranium processing plant worldwide, there's no way to get anywhere close to a nuclear complex without getting your ass beat. This nuclear facility in Siberia is rumored to be among the most secure in the world because they have like six of these fuckers. And you can just forget about hijacking a nuclear submarine too because all of them have these totally roided up dudes that'll just swim up to you and choke you out. The acquisition of nuclear weapons by a terrorist group such as ISIS would be potentially catastrophic with at least a dozen government officials losing their jobs. Secretary of State John Kerry would be fired. Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter would be fired. Nuclear Security Secretary Frank Klotz would be fired. National Security Agency Director Michael Rogers also fired. Deputy Administrator for Defense Programs Donald Cook fired. Security experts say that if a rogue state such as Iran acquired a nuclear weapon, it could even trigger a doomsday scenario in which entire departments would be wiped out and would have to be completely restaffed by what few officials survive.
Is there a man in your life who would like to dent in his penis? If so, we'd like to hear from you. Send a notarized readout of the specific gravity of his penis and a stool sample at 730 North Franklin Street, 7th floor, Chicago, Illinois, 60654. For our next segment, let's check in on our online poll to name the perfect human. Looks like Jewfucker69 is still the leader. So today we're going to show you some quick and easy health tips to help you survive being shot point blank in the chest. Now, Dr. Lisa, a bullet blasting towards your heart from a few inches away doesn't have to be a death sentence. No, it doesn't. The first thing you can do is carry a shield with you everywhere. To the gym, to the grocery store, to the set of your successful daytime talk show, never leave the house without your shield. I prefer iron or steel, but you can also use tightly bound planks of linden wood. Wood is less reliable against bullets, but much easier on the back, which is helpful for pregnant or large-breasted women. Carrying them not only protects you from the bullets, but also strengthens your muscles and does wonders for cardiovascular health. <laughs> exactly. It's important you can hold on to your shield firmly during a gun attack. That's why you want to switch your arms a few times during the day so you're not tired when being shot at. What I'm seeing a lot of now is people utilizing two smaller Viking-style shields, one for defense and the other for attacking. That sounds fun. There's also some great chainmail and plate armor you can wear to balance your body's weight and work other arm and shoulder muscles. A shield is all the health insurance you'll ever need, so throw out that expensive family plan you barely use and replace it with useful iron shields for all your loved ones. And of course, don't forget to insure your shield. An uninsured shield is practically worthless. That goes without saying. Dr. Lisa, I noticed you have a nice picture of a raven on your shield, which brings me to another important point. Warding off bullets can be fun, so express yourself using your shield. Put something fun on it, like a, a family crest. People are more likely to carry shields if they feel confident about them. Be proud of your shield, everyone. Whenever you pick up your shield, you should be saying to yourself, this is me, this is my shield, I am my shield. Get creative. Screen print a photo of your grandkids or your favorite band. Dr. Nagume, what do you have on your shield? Oh, my. Oh, that's beautiful. Really Bravo. Nice. Thank you. Does anyone else have a shield in the audience today? There are some solid looking shields out there. I could fire a gun indiscriminately into this audience, and I don't know if I'd hit more than two or three people. That's how many good looking shields are out there. Okay. We've talked shields long enough. Dr. Lisa, let's put that shield of yours to the test. This is my personal gun. Let's see what happens when it tries to penetrate through that shield. This is the proper position to defend yourself against the blast. Here goes. <laughs> Ricochet of a bullet sends out a deafening ring, many times more powerful than the strongest church bell. I may go deaf, but I'll still have my life. If you take your health seriously, you have to have a shield. Put him up! Yeah. Lift him up! Lift him up! Yes! All right, when we come back, stick around, because we're going to show you how to make a delicious pre-sex torta. Yeah, put it up there. I see you. I see it there. Woo! Could multiple stab wounds mean shorter lives? A new study on primates from the National Institute of Health says it's possible. This is a huge step forward in understanding the short and long-term health effects of repeated stabbing. In the $1.2 million study, a test group of 3,000 monkeys were stabbed between seven and nine times Quite each. Thorough. We used a variety of sharp-edged objects to see if they had any different effects on the monkeys. In the end, we concluded that they did not. Collins says the results were similar with baby monkeys, old monkeys, and pregnant monkeys. Results were steady no matter where the monkeys were punctured, in the stomach, the neck, even the eye sockets. The same was true for every species tested, from yellow-tailed woolly monkeys to squirrel monkeys, the small gray monkeys with tufts of downy fur framing their faces. There was a control group that was not stabbed. This group was merely punched. It didn't matter whether we punched them two, three hundred times. All they experienced was bruising. This tells us that the effects of stab wounds are more physical than psychological. Collins and her team hope to secure funding for future studies on the effects of bludgeoning and boiling. And when we continue here tonight, the Catholic Church officially denounces spooning. A new campaign 
campaign from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is already having a big impact on the way teens view smoking. Let's take a look. And joining us here in the studio this morning is the director of this new PSA campaign, Dr. Michael Gaines. Doctor, thanks for stopping by today. Thanks for having me. Now, I've seen a lot of anti-smoking ads that talk about the health risks, but these are completely different. Yes, well, we found those old tactics just weren't working because they weren't relevant to teens. That's exactly These new right. ads talk to kids in their own language. We're saying, understand, if you choose to smoke, people are going to make fun of you for looking like a queer. Really? This year, we're also pushing Congress to replace the warnings on cigarette packages with more effective ones. Well, look at that. Great well, it looks idea. like you've got another Another PSA to show us here. Don't be a faggot. Don't smoke. Well, extraordinary work, Dr. Gaines. Absolutely. I'm impressed. And we're planning more campaigns about teenage drinking that show how getting drunk leads to making out with your same-sex friends. Terrific. And seatbelt ads that show how dangerous it is to be free to prance around like a fairy inside the car. Great idea. It's wonderful. Now, you're going to love this. Our producers actually found some YouTube videos that show just how effective your campaign's been. Let's have a look. I mean, I used to smoke, but then I didn't want everyone to think I'm a gay homo. I had to wait in line behind this gay guy buying cigarettes who couldn't get his change out of his gay pocket. I was like, don't smoke in front of me, gay one. You think I want to watch that? I don't want to smoke because I don't want to look like a cock magnet. That's amazing. Now, I have to say these ads are geared toward the boys. Oh, good point. What about point. the girls? Oh, yes. We have a glossy magazine campaign for the girls. It features oh. 10 full-page ads with a woman smoking wow. while welding, there smoking while driving a big rig, smoking Perfect. while working construction. Wonderful. Oh. Dr. Michael Gaines, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And you stick around because coming up after the break, we're going to be visited by a singer-songwriter who's going to teach us how to write lyrics to yeah. songs that sound like they're about sea creatures but are actually about sex. Stay oh. with us. Are you here all by yourself? Ma'am, I'm eight years old. You think I'd be here alone? I don't think so. This is Peter Rosenthal, head film critic for The Onion. In today's cinema classic segment, I'm going to be looking at Home Alone, the hit holiday comedy starring Macaulay Culkin as young Kevin McAllister, who, after he's accidentally left behind by his vacationing family, has to defend his home from two dim-witted burglars with a series of elaborate traps. Events that surely could have been avoided if Kevin's father owned a gun and taught him how to use it. The film begins with the McAllister family rushing to the airport for their flight to Paris, and in the mayhem, they mistakenly leave Kevin behind. This is not their only instance of reckless behavior. Kevin's dad, played by John Hurd, has no firearms in the house that his son can use to defend himself when the criminals arrive. Fancy trips to Paris are nice, but you know what's even nicer? the peace of mind that your home is secure and that your children know how to defend themselves with a firearm. In Home Alone's most memorable sequence, Kevin rigs the house with a number of booby traps. And while these scenes might be entertaining, they're also dangerously misleading. If you have two seasoned criminals coming after your child, do you want him to protect himself with an obstacle course of toys? Of course not. You want him equipped with a firearm and the muscle memory that comes from patient, responsible training. Paint cans aren't gonna save you. Only a gun can do that. Our founding fathers knew this. That's why they wrote the Second Amendment. Paul Revere didn't yell, the British are coming, arrange your Christmas ornaments and zip lines. He grabbed a musket and defended his land. One of the more troubling aspects of this film is that it trains children to think that criminals are as goofy and inept as Harry, played by Joe Pesci, and Marv, played by Daniel Stern. The fact is there are bad people in this world and when they get a hold of you, they're going to do a lot more than give you a talking to. They'll hogtie you and shoot your brains all over the wall. If the McAllisters were responsible parents, the movie would have ended about 30 minutes in, after Kevin first spots the wet bandits on his property, grabs his dad's gun, and shoots to kill. If you detect a trespasser and fear bodily harm, 
deadly force is protected by law, and each of my children knows this. At one truly ridiculous turn, Kevin tries to stop the men by placing ornaments on the floor under the windowsill. My son would have known to duck behind the Christmas tree, steady his weapon with both hands, turn around, and eliminate the threat quickly and lethally. Now I also want to talk about Kevin's traps. The burning doorknob, the blowtorch, these devices aren't safe. They could set the house on fire. A gun, responsibly used and maintained, is extremely safe. Personally, I keep a Beretta 92 FS on my nightstand loaded with Hydroshock hollow points. I can grab it and fire without even having to get out of bed. All my kids, including my youngest, an eight-year-old boy just like Kevin, know where to find it and what to do with it. But precisely because of its pitfalls, Home Alone is an excellent teaching tool. Every holiday season when my family gathers to watch this film, I use it as an opportunity to remind my wife and kids that if you don't put in the time on the shooting range, you're just a sitting duck. I can tell you this much. If Harry and Marv ever broke into my house, they wouldn't be slipping on little toy cars. They'd be slipping on their own blood. For The Onion's Film Standard, I'm Peter Rosenthal. All right, well, while I'm getting this spray cheese up off the floor, Tracy's going to be talking to two special young men who are really making a difference in their community. Thanks, Jim. I'm sitting here right now with two very special Boy Scouts, Zach Hannaford and Brian Seitz of Troop 128 in Whitehall, New York. They've decided to take on the challenge of promoting the early detection of breast cancer. Wow, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. Tell me everything about your project. Uh, well, in order to get our Eagle Scout badge, we needed to do a, a community service project, and we talked it over, and we thought that we'd do, uh, help women do their breast exams. Wow. Now, you must have done a lot of research. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, we looked all over the internet yeah. to find great websites. I think we're seeing some of them now. Oh, uh, yeah, these ones are really good. Yeah, yeah, the information can be pretty confusing, though, so yeah. women should always ask us for help. Definitely. You've even put together your own website, is that right? Yeah, uh, my older brother Ted's our advisor and he knows how to put together websites, so he helped us put our own. It lists your phone number, so that's a good yeah. way for people to get in contact with you, right? Uh -huh. yeah. They can call us and we'll go to their house anytime. Well, so how's your program going to work? I mean, where do you plan to do these exams? Uh, well, I think we're probably going to do them in my basement. Well, it's not, his basement's not really like a basement basement. It's, has a carpet, and it's so like it's a family finished. room. Well, now, yeah. I've been told that the key to a good self-breast examination is making them a regular part of your normal routine, right? And that way you get to know your breasts and, and can recognize any changes. Now, I like to do mine when I'm in the shower. Yeah, okay. okay. But I understand you can also lie on your bed. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely, uh-huh. I am kind of worried about my own technique, though. Can you show us how to do a good breast exam? Uh, um, well, you first... You know, the, you kind of have yeah. to, like, f look around and, like, feel for the There's lump. The lump and I imagine one. you have to disrobe. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, and then you've got to, like, you got to, like, feel for the bump yeah, if there is one. And you could go in circles. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so there are different techniques then. Is that right, Brian? Yeah. you got to squeeze the nipple to make sure it doesn't feel irregular in the nipple to make sure. Wow, yeah. I'm amazed. Yeah, yeah, you should come over. We can teach you how to do it. Mm -hmm. Sign me up, boys. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing this. Um, the thing with the age? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, we're really focusing on younger women because, you know, older women mo uh, know most of this stuff already. What an excellent point. Coming up next, we'll visit our third Kenyan this week. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. is buzzing over Apple's latest must-have gadget, the MacBook Wheel, a revolutionary new laptop that does away with the keyboard. Tech Trends reporter Jeff Tate has more.
Thanks, Andrea. Say goodbye to the keyboard and hello to the future of laptop computers. With the MacBook wheel, Apple has replaced the traditional keyboard with a sleek, touch-sensitive click wheel. Apple CEO Steve Jobs introduced the product yesterday at the annual Mac Expo. Senior product innovator Brian Gilman says the MacBook wheel will make typing a thing of the past. At Apple, our philosophy is create products that are simple to use. And nothing's more simple than a single giant button. Gilman showed me how the revolutionary new computer works. Just uh, open the Intuitype alphabet menu here, scroll to the letter you need, see? And center click to select it. Then click again to capitalize and uh, repeat this process for each new letter. It couldn't be simpler. Huh. You can also let the predictive sentence technology complete the sentence for you. Gilman says the MacBook wheel has also simplified the organization of files, so searching your hard drive will be a snap. Just press both sides of the wheel concurrently and center click in there. You have an alphabetical listing of every file on your hard drive. Everything is just a few hundred clicks away. Apple is calling the MacBook wheel the most intuitive product ever designed. Here at Apple, we like to think that we're giving customers features they don't even realize they want yet. While the MacBook wheel won't hit the shelves for another three to 15 months, many Apple users already have it on their wish list. I'll buy almost anything if it's shiny and made by Apple. Alex Zalbin was one of the lucky few to get to try out a Mac wheel and spent 45 minutes typing an email to his friend. I never really realized how much I hated keyboards until I saw this thing. I like how the email automatically says sent from a MacBook wheel, that way people know you have one. With a price tag of just under $2,600 for the lowest end MacBook wheel, it is an investment. But the super thin laptop features numerous innovations like the new ultra thin Hummingbird battery, which can power the MacBook wheel for a full 19 minutes before needing to be recharged. And the computer is virtually unbreakable unless dropped or hit. But Apple isn't resting on its laurels. Brian Gilman said they are already hard at work on the next generation of the MacBook wheel, which will be four ounces lighter due to its lack of screen hard drive or wheel. For the Onion News Network, I'm Jeff Tate. Thank you for that, Jeff. It remains to be seen if the wheel will catch on in the business world where people use computers for actual work and not just dicking around. Moving on, police warn that the Sudoku killer will kill either one, four, or nine victims next. Kids at Home, this next segment is for you. This Friday, the newest batch of Disney Channel stars grown in the Disney Genetic Engineering Lab will be unveiled to the public. Right. Now, Tracy, most of our viewers are already familiar with a lot of the products that have come out of the Disney I know Lab. I am. Yes. But how exactly do you create a Hillary Duff or a Miley Cyrus from scratch? Right. Well, we're going to find out exactly how it's done right now because joining us live from the Disney Lab is uh, one of their lead geneticists, Dr. Andrew Rourke. Welcome, Dr. Rourke. There's quite an operation you've got going on out well, there. thanks, Jim. So the stars that we see on TV are actually grown right here? Uh, that's correct. They're, they're grown and uh, developed here. We engineer their brains for advanced singing and dancing capabilities, even posing for photos. By the time they grow to desired size, uh, these child stars are fully ready for the camera or the, the concert uh, tours or whatever Disney chooses to put them in. That is simply amazing. <laughs> now, how long does it take to actually create a star from scratch? Well, not very long at all. We use the exact same DNA structure for all of our stars, and then we simply tweak minor details like uh, hair color or skin tone. Right, yeah, we do have some footage here of some of the uh, well-known creations that have come out of your lab. Let's take a look. Yes, well, that's model 6831-A, publicly known as Mitchell Musso, standard male base with oh, a type wow. 3 skin pigmentation. Wow. And that's model 6831-B. We gave them slightly thicker eyebrows and type 5 skin. Well, so yeah. it's sort of like putting a puzzle together there. Exactly, exactly. Amazing. Okay, here we've got some of the images of some of the newest models. We're going to be seeing a lot of these kids it in the future. It really looks like you have someone for every kid in America right. to love well, that's here. That's the idea, Tracy. Our writers find it very liberating. Uh, for example, our new model, Haley, is a singing, dancing, snowboarding, half Japanese, half Indian wow. girl. Wow. Now, finding her in reality would be impossible. Right, but sounds like a surefire hit to me. Oh, now this one's Zach Efron. I've seen him before. Oh. Yes, uh, Zach was actually one of our earliest My models. My daughters love him. I mean, he looks so real. Actually, I think we could have done a better job with Zach. He could show more human tendencies. Uh, if, if you look closely, you'll notice there's a certain deadness around the eyes. I do see that, yeah. yes. I, I'm sorry, it's hard for me to watch because all I see is uh, all my mistakes. Well, yeah. oh, he seems flawless to me. Well, he's holding up, but there was a bug in that first batch, and as a result, Zach's skin will soon begin to dissolve. No, 
poor Zac Efron. All right. Well, it's simply amazing. Dr. Rourke, thank you so much for coming in and spending some of your morning with us. I can't wait to see some of these Absolutely. new creations <laughs> popping out of the lab. <laughs>To help you understand a communist nation that is somehow even more grotesquely capitalistic than our own, we now present The Onion Explains, China. With its GDP growing at double-digit rates for most of the past 30 years, China has emerged as a global economic titan, boasting a surging industrial sector, vast new public works projects, and a rapidly expanding consumer base, nearly all of which can be attributed to the lucrative residual checks the country continues to receive for the invention of fireworks during the Tang Dynasty. While China earns a payment of only five cents per bottle rocket and aerial repeater, the sheer number sold since their invention in the 7th century has provided a steady stream of royalty checks that total roughly $83 trillion every month. In fact, the combined profits from China's next largest industries are dwarfed by fireworks residual payments and firecracker licensing fees, which now make up 99.1% of China's economy. While China is all but guaranteed to become the world's largest economy and the dominant global political power in the coming years, you really shouldn't get too worked up about it. Because sometimes in life, other people beat you. And even if that makes you sad, the only thing you can do is accept it and move on. These things happen. And part of growing up is realizing that there's no shame in being number two. Besides, just because someone else may have done a little better than you doesn't mean you can't still do a great job too. Being the runner-up doesn't mean you're bad at all. So cheer up. And remember that not everything's going to go your way every time. And that's okay. Sound good? Great. Now go get them. While China's growth has been strong and steady for a generation, the country's future expansion will almost certainly be limited by the fact that there is a finite amount of space on the planet Earth, and that it will likely be centuries before China develops the means to travel to other habitable planets and expand its sphere of influence beyond our solar system. Unless China's space agency invents the interstellar propulsion technology necessary to expand the nation's reach to planets in distant star clusters, then the end is in sight for China's boom times. For China, the party is almost over, likely leaving the nation with economic, military, and cultural dominance over just a single celestial body, and leaving the vast majority of the galaxy, and indeed the universe, sadly and humiliatingly out of reach for the once unstoppable economic juggernaut. We now continue with our coverage of yesterday's tragic school shooting at Olinda High School in Tampa Bay, Florida. That's right, Tracy. Details are still coming in, but uh, here's what we've learned. We know that sophomore Bobby Knowles had a troubled past, including repeated conflicts with teachers, uh, turbulent home life, and three previous school shootings. And he was often described as a loner. Community members are asking the question this morning, could this disaster have been prevented? He was a bit unusual, but I never thought I'd see him do anything like this again. Now, earlier this morning, we spoke by telephone with a student at the school who was a witness to the shootings. He always wore weird clothes, and I guess he shot a bunch of kids a few times. No one really hung out with him. With us now is Dr. Claire Loyola from the American Child Psychiatric Institute. Welcome, doctor. Thank you, Tracy. We have some photos of Bobby through the years. Would you mind giving us your professional interpretation? Yes, now looking at these photos, some aspects of his behavior may have been red flags. Oh, how he's holding that gun there. And look at the skull on his sweatshirt, the dark colors in his clothes. These are symbols that teenagers often use to express unhappiness. This morning, the Onion News Network obtained some disturbing poetry Bobby had written in an English class. Let's take a look. It says, I hate everyone in school, every single one. In a matter of days, they will all pay. Yes, I think that entry actually is a few years old. Oh, sure. That's, that's right. This is the poem from last week. In retrospect, should Bobby's teachers have recognized this as a warning, Dr. Loyola? Well, Tracy, it would have been very difficult for teachers to know if this poem was just standard adolescent antisocial behavior or a memory of a previous school shooting or something they really needed to be worried about. Excuse me, doctor, we've just received some breaking news. Police have just discovered plans that Bobby had made in preparation 
for another school shooting that he planned to carry out in February. Dr. Loyola, should Bobby's shooting yesterday be seen as a potential warning sign of that future shooting? Well, possibly, Tracy, but it's important not to jump to conclusions here. Yesterday's shooting may simply have been a cry for help and not an indication that he would become violent again. Wise words, Dr. Loyola. Thank you very much for spending some time with us this morning here on Today Now. And stay tuned because when we come back, we're going to be talking to a teacher from Olinda High School who knew Bobby for three years and was shot by him 11 times. Stay with us. Video game players celebrated this week as a hotly anticipated sequel to the popular online video game World of Warcraft hit the shelves. Onion News Network Tech Trends has the story. World of Warcraft. It has 9 million players worldwide, many who say they spend hundreds of hours playing the game every week. Here at the Blizzard Entertainment offices, creators say they couldn't be any more excited about the new expansion pack, World of World of Warcraft. Jonathan Parrish is the vice president of Blizzard Entertainment. World of Warcraft allows Warcraft gamers to do what they like to do more than anything else in life, which is play World of Warcraft. Blizzard programmer Chris Boldman demonstrated how the game works. So here I'm playing as a character named Greg, who's playing World of Warcraft as a level 3 gnome rogue. So uh, I'm going to press my up arrow key, and that's going to make him press his up arrow key, which is going to make the character on his screen kind of move forward across the screen. What this game is going to do is put you in the shoes of someone, imagining they're in the shoes of a, an elf, a dwarf, a mage, a troll. The fan response has been great. The game sold over 100,000 copies its first day of release. My avatar is the biggest World of Warcraft fan in the whole World of World of Warcraft world. The game promises to bring a level of realism to video gaming never before seen. Here, I'm going to press Alt-Shift-7. And that's going to make uh, my character uh, start scrolling through the terms of use agreement and the end user license agreement. And it's fun to just play a character who's getting lost in this whole other sort of fantasy world. The graphics are amazing. Uh, they're revolutionary. I mean, when, you, when you're staring at the computer screen, you actually believe that you're in a dimly lit basement staring at a computer screen. With each keystroke, you're just like, oh my god, that sounds exactly like the keystrokes that I know from my own personal experience of hitting keys. Based on the game's big success, Blizzard Entertainment is already looking ahead to their next release plan for fall of 2009. Fans love World of World of Warcraft, and we know they're going to want their characters to be able to play the game as well, so we've already started work on World of World of Warcraft, the World of Warcraft realm. For the Onion News Network, I'm Jeff Tate. When we come back, an Atlanta man mauled by a pit bull puppy describes the adorable attack. For this game, you can customize your own avatar. So my avatar, I uh, made him, he's like 20 something years old. He works at a, a video game company. He's uh, really good at puzzles. Your character can do anything that a real human playing the World of Warcraft could do. So there's almost like no limits. The worst thing that can happen in the game is that your avatar's internet connection goes down. Then you have to make your avatar get on the phone with your internet service provider. So we had planned to show you the safest ways to fuck in a jacuzzi, but as you are all aware, Dr. Good tragically passed away this weekend very suddenly and for no reason. It seems that the SIDS that he survived as a child finally claimed him as an adult. I mean, he was in perfect health. Really, it just, it makes no sense. We may be doctors, but there are some things even we can't control. We're still reeling here, and um, I don't know that we can do justice to the jacuzzi fucking segment that we had planned. So, in the meantime, let's, let's look at a clip from Happier Times.
I think the perfect human likes your piano playing, Dr. Tennant. Why, he's dancing! <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that's enough piano, Dr. Tannis. Thank you. All right, coming up later on the show, we're going to pierce someone's eardrum so we can all hear the hiss. But right now, we have news of an important new report linking poor sleep habits to Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, we don't want any of that crap in our brains. Basically, it states if you don't sleep, even for a night, you're practically giving up your brain to that degenerative disease. That's why today's nap time segment is so important. Let's get ready for our weekly nap and really stick it to Alzheimer's. Everybody ready? Okay. Get to sleep right here, right now. Who wants to sleep? Okay. All right. People on this side want to sleep? What about this side? Getting sleepy? I can't tell who's more tired. Yeah, okay. Well, there's only one way to find out. Everybody close your eyes, even the viewers at home. Okay, take a deep breath. Start counting sheep and on three, one, two, three, sleep. Sleeping forges important neural pathways and boosts metabolism. So really get to sleep as fast as you can and shut out that dementia. Come on, gang. Come on, come on, sleep. Your brain needs to regenerate itself. Did you know that every second you're awake is another second closer to total brain decay? So put your heads down, get to bed, unless you want to be 65 years old and have no idea who the hell your grandchildren are. Look at the doctors. They're doing it. Do what the doctors do. Even the perfect human needs his sleep. Sleep is when your brain waves strengthen your memory. And we're talking about Alzheimer's here. That's a fate worse than death. So really let that sink in and relax and go night-night. Go to sleep, guys. Go to sleep. You have slept for sleep. one minute. There are 14 minutes remaining in nap time. Thank you. Go to sleep. Go to sleep. Put your head maybe put your head on your shoulder. Go to sleep. Go to sleep. This is a serious problem with a health issue. Go to sleep. I don't know what's wrong with you. You have terrible sleeping habits. I wouldn't be surprised if you wake up demented tomorrow. Real shame. Well, we're gonna take a quick break so I can get some sleep. When we wake up, we're gonna take a look at God's sex life and see what the man upstairs can do to spice things up. Go to sleep, guys. Sleep. For those hoping to get ahead of the work week, look no further than Overtime Plus, a new app that lets you work for your company even while you sleep. The app from Houston developer Creative Mode keeps you trapped in a constant half-awake, half-dream state where your thoughts are never far from the drudgeries of the work week. Falling asleep is the most opportune time to dwell on your job and think about how you could be doing it better. Our app makes sure that the time that you'd normally waste on recuperation is spent towards more productive tasks, like planning your response to why your project's $10,000 over budget. By simply laying your phone on your mattress, the app's accelerator accelerometers are able to measure your movements throughout the night, so it knows when you're close to falling into a deep sleep and losing focus of the crushing work demands ahead of you. When restful sleep is detected, the app dips into your personalized work tasks to generate a subliminal signal, like the date of an important deadline, or keywords from the most damning portion of your last job review, to jostle you back into a state of productive, semi-awake agitation. I was close to falling asleep last night, then my app started whispering my boss's name over and over again until I was awake and answered work emails at 3 in the morning. Last night it made me dream that I was locked in the office until I could find the most optimal way to catalog the company's new server. I still haven't figured it out. The app doesn't just keep you mentally shackled to your day job, but also serves as an alarm clock by repeatedly shouting you're late for you're work late for until work. you're jolted out you're of bed in a work. panic each morning. Later in the hour, we'll see how long it takes me to vomit while wearing the new VR headset from Oculus Rift. parent's worst nightmare, of course, is that their child falls victim to a sexual predator. But it's hard to know how to keep your kids safe. Mm. Yeah, it is. But today we're going to get some insider tips from a child safety expert and ex-pedophile, Terry Parker. Welcome to the show, Hi, Terry. Hi, Jim and Tracy. Thanks Hi, for having Terry. me. Oh, thank you for being now, here. Now, Terry actually kidnapped and sexually molested children for over 20 years. Wow. And he was eventually convicted of 13 counts of sexual assault against minors. Yes, well, that's all behind me now. I don't do that 
sort of thing anymore. Now, Terry, you say first off that a lot of the conventional wisdom we all know about how to protect our children from predators is actually wrong. Yes, for instance, a lot of people tell their kids, don't talk to strangers. Uh -huh. I tell my kids that all the time. Yeah. Right. Oh. When a pedophile is looking for a little boy or girl to take, he's not interested in having a conversation with them. He simply wants their small body pressed against his. So he's going to abduct them whether they talk to him or not. Yeah, you don't have to lure them into a car. You simply take the child where you want them. Their bodies are so light. But you do mm. recommend that parents try to make their children less attractive to pedophiles, right? Right. Clothing is a huge factor. If you put a girl in a sundress and French braids oh. in front of the average pedophile, he's going to get an erection that'll rip his bike shorts. Well, that's good to know. Yes, it is. So what should parents do? Dress them in dirty clothing, mess up their hair. Still, this will only deter about 90% of all pedophiles. You know, personally, I prefer a kid that looks a little rough and tumble. Before we go, I have to discuss the situation that no one wants to face. Your child is abducted, uh, there's no ransom note, so you know the motive mm -hmm. isn't money, it's sex. And how can a parent hope to get their child mm -hmm. back? First of all, he or she won't be a child anymore. No? Any childhood innocence will have been stripped away the moment the pedophile's sweaty arm goes down your kid's pants. Uh -huh. Your child's best bet is to grab a sharp object to stab at the man oh. with, like a pencil, which really? is actually how I got this. Ooh, I bet you didn't get very far with that kid. Not that one, no. Well, Terry, well, thank you so much for being with us this morning and opening our eyes to this situation. And if we can just protect one child out there from people like you, we will have done our job. I'm glad to help. Yeah. Thanks, Terry. Okay, coming up next, out of the frying pan and into the dryer, a new way to make pierogi. Yum, yum. Tech Trends, brought to you by Starbucks Double Shot. In a competitive tech world, companies are always looking to the latest trend to keep their employees productive and happy at the office. But a new study suggests that employees are actually happiest when they're simply pretending to work from home. The study from tech and consulting giant IBM found employees felt overall more focused and content with their jobs when doing personal tasks like catching up on laundry or their favorite TV shows when they should be working. I just make sure that I send some emails to my supervisor first thing in the morning so he thinks I'm up and working, but then I just go right back to bed. I never have to deal with rush hour traffic or anything. I just walk across the room, sit down at my desk, and start browsing through my Twitter feed immediately. The trend is making its way to the country's most influential tech companies like Google, where employees are encouraged to put in 12 empty hours of work a week from their homes. The study hasn't swayed every company, however. Yahoo! CEO Marissa Meyer said in a statement, At Yahoo! we prefer that our employees pretend to work side by side right here in our offices. Next up, Apple's new summer iPhone soaks you with mosquito repellent to keep you bite free throughout the year's hottest months. This is Peter Rosenthal, head film critic for The Onion. In today's Cinema Classic segment, I'll be looking at E.T., a touching family science fiction movie filled with heart and imagination, but one that perplexingly fails to deliver on its titular promise of an electronic turtle. In fact, despite being titled E.T., an electronic turtle never once appears in the movie and, curiously, is never so much as mentioned. Since its 1982 release, Steven Spielberg's classic film has captivated generations of moviegoers with its timeless story of family and friendship, and has also, for over 30 years, left myself and what must be millions of audience members just like me asking the same questions. Where is the electronic turtle? What does this story have to do with an electronic turtle? Who are all these characters and where is the electronic turtle? 
In fact, the movie itself spends the vast majority of its running time telling the story of a young boy who finds a lost extraterrestrial, coincidentally and confusingly also called E.T., while never once showing the actual robotic reptile audiences came to see in the first place. One could perhaps argue that the alien in the movie possesses some vaguely tortoise-like qualities, but of course, he could never be categorized as a true electronic turtle and, therefore, disappoints. Certainly the movie's posters do mention an extraterrestrial, and yet the E.T. is consistently given higher billing, making it all the more bizarre that there isn't so much as one scene featuring an electronic turtle. Throughout the film, we wait for the turtle to appear, and yet Spielberg continues to withhold it, even during moments that are practically calling out for just such an appearance. This scene, for example, is good, but imagine if an electronic turtle were to suddenly appear with his circuitry loudly whirring and his tiny remote-controlled legs inching him forward slowly but surely. One can only assume Spielberg's decision to never see or hear from the E.T. was made intentionally to subvert viewers' expectations. Perhaps the title is merely a metaphor, wherein the non-existent electronic turtle is meant to symbolize the unfulfilled hopes and dreams of childhood. I myself have asked Spielberg about my theories regarding the electronic turtle during dozens of Hollywood film panels, and the director has consistently refused to answer. On one occasion, he even had me removed from the room. A true visionary, committed to maintaining the enigmatic grace of his film. For The Onion's Film Standard, I'm Peter Rosenthal. Remember the movie E.T.? We all love that movie, right? The little kid who befriends an alien from outer love space. That movie. Well, today we have a young man right here in our studio who actually found his own E.T. while he was on vacation with his family. Say hello to 11-year-old Thomas Deming from Duluth, Minnesota and his magical friend. Hi, Thomas. Hello. Good morning. This is such an exciting story. How did you find this little guy? Well, I heard some noises in, bush, in the bushes. Right. So I went out to see what it was and I just found it. A wrinkled, hunched up little brown E.T. It was so lost and confused, and it was talking really fast in its space language, like beep boop boop. <laughs> I just knew I had to help That's it. Great. Oh, that is so sweet. So you Thomas. snuck it back home and you hid it in your closet for how long? Three weeks. Wow. I fed it Reese's pieces so it wouldn't get hungry. Good thinking. Por favor, tengo que encontrar a mi familia. I wish I could understand you, little buddy. Por favor, tengo que. Thomas, your parents had no idea you had this little guy hidden away under your sweaters. Yeah, but one day my dad heard him making these crying sounds. Uh huh. I think maybe that's how it breathes because oh. it cries all the time. Were you worried oh. then that your parents might make you send it back That's... to its home planet? Yeah, That's but right. then I showed them how I taught it some English. Oh, cool. And they're really impressed. Oh. Do you want to hear some English? Sure, oh, we love absolutely. E.T. English. English. Phone home. Oh, look at that phone home, just like in the movie. Oh, that's terrific. <laughs> that's wonderful. Uh, I wish you could me. talk people language more than just phone home, though. I don't understand that yeah. at all. Dad says that I have to hide it. So if I take it outside, I always put it in my dad's clothes, so it looks like a little me. What a great idea, yeah. Now, I think you brought a photo with you, too. Let's... Oh, how cute! Yeah, me too was supposed to make my bike fly, yeah. right? but it didn't, no. so it fell off. Oh, how oh. It was really breathing really hard after that. Este niño. Oh, he's doing the finger thing! Oh, he's doing the finger thing! Oh, look at that! Oh, look at that! Oh, no, 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 no. Sit! No. Sit! No. Sit! Sit! It's okay, little buddy. It's okay. Sit! Look at this! Sit! Tengo que volver a mi casa. Have some more of your Reese's pieces. Oh, good idea. Of course. You've got him so well trained. That's great. Uh, the Reese's Pieces and... Thomas, what's he doing now? Oh, look at He's that. been doing that a lot lately. I think it's how it communicates with its home world. You know, Thomas, it must be just a tremendous responsibility to be taking care of your own E.T. all by your young self, right? Yeah, I guess. Well, maybe it would be a better idea if someone took care of it for you, and then you wouldn't have to worry anymore. What do you think? And we've got friends here at Today Now, Thomas, that would like to come and just have a have a little chat with no. your ET. No, you all we're going to do is just no. ask you some questions. No, 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 no,
fucking joke. Well, I guess we all learned a very valuable lesson about friendship today, didn't we? And stay with us because coming up after the break, we're going to ask the important question, do our dogs know enough about our founding fathers? Americans than ever are planning to travel this summer. But what if taking that vacation doesn't turn out to be as expensive as you think? Travel expert Kathy Barnett joins us now with an affordable summer getaway solution, taking a vacation in your mind. Oh, Hi, Kathy. Good morning, Hi, Kathy. Hi, Tracy. So, Kathy, what exactly is a mind vacation? Well, instead of actually taking a trip, you simply close your eyes and imagine you're taking oh. a trip. It's just as good as a traditional vacation, but at a fraction of the cost. Oh. So fun. Mm -hmm. Well, Kathy, we're seeing some photos photos here of you on some of your mind vacations. Yes, yes. Oh, here I am in Paris last summer. Mm -hmm. Oh, and here I'm in Hawaii and I'm laying on the sand and I'm reading the latest Stieg Larsson novel. Oh, that's oh clever. Yeah. Kathy, what do people need to know if they want to take their own mind vacation? Well, well, the first thing is it's always very important to dress comfortably. Mm -hmm. If you're going to Italy, you're going to be sitting there for eight hours imagining that plane ride. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, you imagine a good stiff tailwind. Then you can make it in about seven and a half. Mm, right. Good tip. Now, you say it's always a good idea to set a maximum amount for your own mind vacation. Yes. It's so important, but the great thing about a mind vacation is that you can imagine you're eating a four-star meal, even if you are just eating your usual tuna out of the can. Mm. Oh, see, here I am at Buca well, de Beppo at, oh. at the Universal Studio City Walk. Oh, yum, wonderful. yum. Well, Kathy, you say that if people really want to save money, that we should be looking for last-minute deals. Is totally. That right? Last year, uh -huh. there was a sale at the store I was in on bulk canned stew and adult diapers. Now, that was enough for me to sit in my barca lounger for a six-day trip at half the usual cost. Wow. Now, our viewers at home should also know that you don't have to go on a mind vacation alone oh, either, do you? Nope. Here's me on a trip to Vermont with my sister, Diane. Uh -huh. Diane has been sick for a very long time, so it's really good for her to pretend to get out occasionally. Sure. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're both on the same page with what you're imagining, mm -hmm. it'll work out great. Mm -hmm. Great. Kathy, you also encourage people to use these techniques in their just normal daily lives as right. well, right? I do. I imagine that I went to a four-year university, uh -huh. and in my mind, I have the same bachelor degree as everybody else, <laughs> right. but none of the debt. Good point. Oh, and I also got married at Buckingham Palace last week to a cool, <sighs> wonderful man that I met on a cruise through the Orient. Oh, and look at you now. You're being interviewed on the Today Now Morning Show. Oh, right? isn't it wonderful? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Oh, oh, we're going to commercial now. Let's take a look at I Know What You Did Last Summer. This 1997 slasher hit features a hook-wielding madman that stalks and murders the teens who left him for dead in a drunken hit and run. But what's truly shocking in the film is the fact that the killer doesn't just sue these kids and their parents for every last penny. The killer repeatedly goes to great lengths to slaughter the teenagers who ran him over and dumped him in the ocean, when he could have easily gotten his revenge by filing a personal injury lawsuit that would have made him rich beyond belief. When watching this film, it's easy to be distracted by the fact that these teens, who not only fatally struck a pedestrian, but then tried to cover up the accident, could get the comeuppance they so richly deserve if the killer simply brought them before pretty much any civil court judge in the country. That's an eight-figure payday easy. Easy. I Know What You Did Last Summer is ultimately doomed by the senseless actions of its antagonist, who seeks vengeance through grisly murder when there was 15 or 20 million bucks in punitive damages just waiting for him. Really? We should all be so lucky. For The Onions Film Standard, I'm Peter Rosenthal. To help you understand how dangerous narcotics operations have persisted, despite decades of bold efforts to completely mishandle the problem, we now present The Onion Explained, The Drug Trade. In order to get their product to the 25 million users of illicit drugs in the United States, cartels require an efficient and low-risk smuggling system. And so the thousands of tons of drugs entering the U.S. each year are all transported inside the body of a single courier named Greg. Once a year, 
The world's drug cartels are believed to gather in an enormous warehouse somewhere in Latin America, where Greg will swallow approximately 100 million drug-filled condoms. Once Greg ingests the drugs, he boards a commercial airliner bound for the U.S., first having to pass through airport security without arousing suspicion. All told, the DEA estimates that 1,800 tons of cocaine alone are packed inside Greg's digestive tract, along with approximately 400 tons of methamphetamine and 500 tons of pure heroin. These figures suggest that every illegal drug currently being sold or used in the United States has passed through Greg's anus. Though everyday Latin Americans are concerned about the abundance of illicit drugs, most are willing to put up with them for the benefits of having cartels wage constant bloody war in the streets. The vast majority of people in drug manufacturing regions such as Mexico and Central America realize that the murder and kidnappings they enjoy every day are only possible because of the profits from these illegal substances. Unfortunately, the carnage just can't be sustained without them. The war on drugs has been waged through traditional law enforcement measures, but the cartels remain as powerful as ever. Experts increasingly say that the only solution is to eliminate the demand for illegal drugs by instead getting buzzed on common household products, like cough syrup. Not only do items such as nail polish remover and model glue get you ripped if you really breathe that shit in, they also help shrink the market for cartel drugs. Cartels would stand to lose billions if even a third of the people using their cocaine or methamphetamine instead huffed Freon, which will knock you right on your ass just as quickly. It's easy to get by cracking open an air conditioner. In fact, if enough people realize that keyboard cleaner will put you in a fucking insane trance and that it's just sitting there right now in your desk drawer. The costly war on drugs could very well end tomorrow. We're so excited to welcome one of Hollywood's brightest creative talents, the screenwriter behind this summer's blockbuster, the new Fast and the Furious movie, Fast Five. Chris Morgan, thanks for Hi. joining us. Hi, Chris. Now, Chris, these Fast and the Furious movies are just getting bigger and better. So when you sat down to write this installment, were there certain elements you wanted to include? I want the cars to drive fast and then some of them explode. Oh, that sounds so great. Now, I believe we have a clip to show our audience at home. Can you set the clip up for us, Chris? Uh-huh. The car went out of the train, and then there's a hole in the train. Uh-huh. And then the, the car brought the box, then the police went after them, then the, the, the box hit the car and then it crashed into the ocean. Whoa! <laughs> Looks like this movie never slows and down. And it's not the car goes zoom. And at this not the time it goes ah. oh, oh, no spoilers, no spoilers. So, Chris, one of the biggest stars in the business is in this movie. Vin Diesel, was, what was it like working with him? He has big muscles, and in the movie he said, I thought I was done with this. Now, I understand the movie stays pretty much 100% true to your original screenplay. Yep. Wow, it's so great to have that kind mm. of a chemistry with a director. And I understand Jordana Brewster is coming back for this installment. Yeah, she's a girl, and she likes to kiss, so she doesn't play with the cars, but some Sometimes she does, but mostly just the boys. Now, this is one thing I really love about your movies, Chris. I mean, all the female characters are so strong. Can I take off my shoes now? Oh, sure. Like your last movie, Wanted, with Angelina Jolie? She is so tough. Yep. She sees a bullet, and the bullet went poof around her face, but she didn't die. Only had to take a bath. See, I love that. Now, before we go, Chris, I have to ask you, is there a chance we're going to see more Fast and the Furious sequels? Yeah. Well, how many? A 600. Whoa. Well, I know where I'll be every summer. Well, Chris Morgan, thanks so much for joining us here on uh, Today Now this morning. Oh, it looks like he's talking himself out. Right in all those moves. Right. Don't forget, this Friday, Fast Five premieres in theaters. And when we come back, we'll talk to an old woman who thinks it's 1958, and I'm her dead husband. Stay with us. Do you want to be a pallbearer at Dr. Good's funeral? Feel the label off specially marked Dr. Good Select medications and you can enter to win. Okay, today we're taking a look at sugar. And you might not realize it, but there's sugar in almost everything these days, even bread. And one of the biggest culprits in the sugar department is 
You guessed it, hot soda. Yum, <laughs> yum. We all love a piping hot soda, no one more than me. But according to this new report, that hot soda you love could be adding inches to your waistline. Hot soda really takes a toll on the teeth, too. Look at this animation of a tooth submerged in hot soda. Makes you think twice about hot soda, huh? But it's not easy to break that habit. You there, girl. I bet you had a hot soda this morning, didn't you? Yes. Why don't you come down here, young one? What are you called? I'm called Yvette. Do you know me? I do not know you. You're young yet. Not so young. Come to me in ten years. This night? This night. Where shall I find you? Where the two roads cross. I know the place. Take this coin. Bury it in the spot where the grass has never grown. I will. Leave it there for ten years. Where the grass has never grown. Retrieve the coin and bring it to me when you come to where the roads cross. Then I will tell you my true name. Will I hear it? That is your decision. Look to me, child. Who do you belong to? My father's called Jeremiah. I would possess you. You cannot. Just goes to show, hot sodas are full of harmful sugars. Okay, we'll be right back. Tomorrow on Dr. Good. Think weight training isn't for you? Think again. This is the best workout you could get in 30 seconds. Just grab your weights and rage! Ah! Work out your body and your anger. I could do this forever! Ah! Tomorrow on an all new Dr. Good. Well, that's it. Tomorrow's my big day. I'm gonna go in for surgery and hopefully you'll come along. Now, I do have to admit that I am in a bit of pain, so I'm really looking forward to this procedure. Uh, and with your support, I think we're both going to find out that having surgery just isn't as scary as it sounds. Hey, if you're just joining us for this very special Today Now event, we're covering our own Jim Haggerty's kidney stone removal surgery live on the air. And that was Jim's final video diary last night. And his surgery is now just minutes oh, away. Oh, Dr. Jeffrey oh, Atka is still with us. And oh, Dr. Atka, tell us how somebody would know if they had kidney stones. Well, the telltale mm. symptom is excruciating pain that makes it nearly impossible to pass urine. Now, most stones, they pass naturally, but the larger ones, like Jim's, can get stuck and cause infection. So, they were Require surgery. Oh, oh, and of course, no. Jim's no, no, showing no. us there's nothing here, to fear right? here. Oh, Jim, how are you doing there? Uh, Tracy, no, I, I'm sorry. I, I've changed my mind. Oh, God, oh, fuck, I can't do it. There's the pain you talked oh, about. Oh, so, Dr. Oh, Atka, tell us what let precautions go, we would right take to prevent oh, us from getting oh, kidney stones. Oh, 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 Always stay hydrated. Oh, please, please, water please. helps the kidneys <laughs> break the stuff down. Ah, hear that, Jim? More water. Oh, what? More water. Oh, Maybe we should replace your coffee. Please go away. Please. Oh, no. Get out. So now, Doctor, is this a picture of Jim's ultrasound? Here? Wow, that is a oh, very God large it. kidney stone he has there. Oh, it, it, it almost I looks like two stones have hell. fused together. Oh, oh, oh. You're gonna have to start a college fund for that one, Jim. Oh, fuck you, Edgar. <laughs> I'm gonna fucking kill you. Now, what are we saying here, Doctor? Well, in a few moments, oh, oh. Uh, they're gonna place a tube in Jim's urethra, which will travel its way up to the ureter, and then shock waves are gonna break it down into smaller chunks, which will then scrape their way out through the ear. Wow. Well, you know. It sounds complicated, but really, it's a simple surgery that has an almost 100% success rate. So there's nothing to be afraid of. Hear that, Jim? Uh, where's the laser? What laser, sir? Oh, just, just shoot my dick with a laser. Poor Jim. Just shoot my dick, please. Oh, now this is cool. That's a camera they're going to use to film the whole surgery from inside Jim's body, Yes, that's going to be pushed into Jim's urethra as well. Now, normally they wouldn't do this. This is purely for the benefit of us watching it on TV. All right, stick with us because Jim's operation is just minutes away. But first, he's going to pop into the children's ward to cheer up some youngsters suffering from terminal illnesses. Stay tuned. Oh, oh, my baby. My baby's killing me. I can't. 